Automated science is the discipline that carries out scientific research without significant intervention by people. The paradigm of automated science we can understand very easily by thinking of self-driving instruments the same way um, we think about self-driving cars. Self-driving cars don't decide where to go. You tell them where to go, but then they take you there. And the idea of uh, self-driving instruments is that we have instruments that are capable of doing large numbers of experiments under computer control, but right now those are used to do something where a person says exactly what experiments to do. The idea of automated science is that we can use artificial intelligence, machine learning, to decide what sequence of experiments to do to achieve a particular goal, just like the self-driving car decides how it's actually going to get you uh, wherever it is that you'd like to go. There are two um, examples that are, I think, uh, useful to talk about. One of them was um, an initial study uh, where the task that they were setting out to do was to learn which genes in yeast uh, allow the yeast to grow in the absence of particular uh, metabolites. Okay, so um, all organisms need various compounds in order to be able to survive, and the, the, the basic test here was that they knew all the different molecules that, it, that are metabolites that a yeast needed. They knew all the genes that, that, that yeast had, but they didn't know which gene enabled it to survive in the absence of a particular metabolite. In other words, to be able to synthesize that metabolite. And so what they built was a very specialized robot that could do an experiment on one uh, yeast strain with one gene knocked out and one uh, metabolite to see whether or not the yeast could grow in the presence of that metabolite. Uh, and um, by doing that, they then also, they built that specialized hardware and they also built an algorithm that would make what's called a decision tree to choose the sequence of experiments to do in order to try to learn the mapping between each gene and each of the metabolites. Um, so this was the first robot scientist and that was created by Ross King and colleagues. And it was able to um, find the matches between the genes and the metabolites more efficiently than doing it the way that people would have probably done it, which would be to do to always choose the cheapest experiment to do next, uh, and they was able to do, to, to do better than that. Uh, our group here at, at Carnegie Mellon uh, later tried to tackle a much harder problem, which is a case where we don't know what the possible outcomes are, where we can do an experiment and where we can get almost any, any answer. And the particular task that we set is one that is very commonly encountered in drug development, which is to learn the effects of many different drugs on many different targets within a cell. And that's the way that drugs are developed. We develop a drug to try to be able to, to affect a particular target that it may be involved in some disease that we're trying to, 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 to correct. So that experiment, what we set up was we used um, what was then commercially available uh, s uh, hardware uh, that can execute experiments. In this case, a um, liquid handling robot and a automated microscope that could take images um, for a particular combination of drug and target. Uh, and then we drove those instruments under computer control using something called active machine learning to decide what experiment to do next in order to try to build a model of the effects of all the drugs on all the compounds. 
And that was the first example of doing automated science where you didn't know in advance what the possible answers could be. Uh, and we ended up with that system showing that we could get a model that was 92% accurate by, while only doing 29% of the possible experiments. Active learning is a subfield of machine learning in which we allow the machine learner to have control over what data it can use to build its models. Most of the machine learning that we, we hear about is created by taking a, a large set of data, typically a large set of data, building a model from that data and then using that model. Um, that model might be learning to recognize your friends or your family uh, based on images that, that, that you tell it, you know, or who the pictures are of, um, and then you use the model. Active learning allows the learner to query you about things that it doesn't already know, that you haven't told it. So for example, it would say, who is this a picture of? So that it could decide whether or not to add that into the model and help, you, help refine its model of who you are or of who your friends are. So active learning, again, is that idea that you let the learner choose what data it's going to learn from. And that turns out to be a very good match to a lot of problems in science. What those problems in science are about is trying to build a model that explains how some system works, whether that's one of our organs or whether that's, you know, a particular cell type or whether that's a particular disease phenotype, which what we want to try to do in general is try to build a model that explains that process, that thing, that system. But that involves often exploring a large experimental space to try to build that model. There are many possible variables that we can vary in order to try to, to learn a model of that. And a lot of experimentalists nowadays try to tackle that problem by just doing all of the possible combinations of those experiments. That is very expensive uh, and that is not necessary. The, uh, and in fact, it's not practical when we talk about many problems that we're, trying, we're interested in where the number of experiments uh, is greater than, you know, than we can reasonably do in any, in any period of time. And so what active learning can do with a problem like that is that it would say, all right, I'll take whatever experiments you've done already and I'll try to build a model from those, just like you would do if you were trying to build a, a passive machine learning model. But then look at that model and ask, what parts of that model do I have the least confidence in? What parts of that model do I not, I'm not really sure about? And those are the ones that I should try to get more data to find out about. It's right. choosing what experiments to do in order to not prove that your model is right, but rather to try to improve whatever model that you have. The rationale behind this creating this degree is that we have the conditions available now to do for science what self-driving cars have started to do for the, the uh, transportation industry. Right? That is, what we need is hardware that is analogous to drive-by-wire cars, hardware that you can operate under computer control, and then um, the ability to construct models from whatever data that you acquire, and the ability to do this active learning to try to figure out what experiments you should do next in order to improve your models. So those pieces are available now, and especially the tremendous advances that, have, that we've seen in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning um, and the tremendous advances that have happened in building automated instruments. So this combination of hardware and 
artificial intelligence software is something that presents us with a unique opportunity going forward. And that is going to need uh, people who are trained in this combination of methods uh, in order to, to help push that, that frontier forward. Companies that manufacture automated instrumentation need people to help them build them. Uh, pharmaceutical companies that use automated instrumentation need people that know how to use it in order to be able uh, to execute the things that they're trying to do. Um, and of course, um, having knowledge about machine learning and model building and active learning can be generally useful. Um, so the the People who graduate from the program will be uniquely positioned to help with the future of automated science, but they will also be positioned uh, to have good opportunities for employment in, uh, in industries that are developing and using those technologies now. I should mention that one of the other um, goals of the program is to enable people to uh, get additional training that would enable them to go to uh, PhD programs, right? So for, for some of the people graduating from the program, we imagine that they would want to be part of that future as researchers uh, and that they might want to go on and get a PhD. So the degree is automated science and we imagine that we're going to have uh, different concentrations within the degree for different sciences or combinations of sciences. But in the first year, we're starting with an emphasis on uh, automated biology. Uh, it's an, a very important uh, field. It's one of the fields in which it's, it's uh, very clear that we need this technology. Uh, and so that's the curriculum that we're, we're rolling out first. In subsequent years, we're going to roll out curricula for other sciences, and, and such as chemistry, and also combinations of science, such as biochemistry. It consists of coursework in the machine learning uh, underpinnings uh, behind all of this, behind model building and active learning. Uh, it consists of uh, hands-on uh, laboratory course courses using automated instrumentation and learning the principles of how to use it and how to design experiments for automated experiments, uh, automated equipment. Uh, it consists of courses in uh, basic um, types of experimental techniques that are used in biology that are then embodied in, in automated instruments. And lastly, it consists of um, courses in areas within biology where there is extensive model building now, most of which has been done not actively, or all of which has been done not through active learning, but through traditional passive learning, but so that people have a, a good understanding of where the field is right now. I said lastly, but actually the last thing is what's called a capstone course, where uh, the students will do actual projects in collaboration with people in industry or people in academic research that uh, will use these techniques uh, in order to solve a particular problem or set up a system that can solve that problem. Students who are coming out of uh, bachelor degree programs in one of the sciences and starting to look for what they want to do next, that those students might be intrigued by the idea of being part of this new revolution and, and that um, learning about automated science would give them potentially a rewarding career, both intellectually and potentially more, uh, more rewarding financially than some of the traditional uh, technician jobs that one might get uh, going directly out of a degree in science. You know, one of the ideal uh, candidates would be someone who has a degree in biology or maybe a degree in biochemistry um, and that has 
some affinity or some experience with using, uh, with programming computers or learning some, some fundamentals of, of computer science. What excites me the most is what excited me about getting into biology in the first place, which is trying to be able to learn how biological systems work, how they go wrong, and how we can fix them. And when I was a graduate student, we thought we could do that by learning laws of biology like there are laws of physics. And it has turned out over the last 30 years or so that we've begun to realize, in other words, by now we, we realize there aren't any laws. There, biological systems are very, very complex and you can't predict from first principles how uh, by a particular biological system works or how it, how it went wrong for a particular disease. Um, the space, therefore, of possible experiments that we might have to do in order to learn how to understand how uh, biological systems work is now much larger than we thought it was going to be. Right? In the old days, we used a, mo a model called reductionism, where we thought we could take things apart and learn how each part worked, and then basically put all of that understanding together and understand how the whole thing works. Uh, it turns out that biological systems are complex systems that have properties that are not present in the individual pieces, properties that emerge when you put the pieces back together. Uh, and that means that you have to basically do experiments for many, many variables in order to understand how a particular system works, and that that number of variables is so large that we can't just use all of them. And this is the technology that enables us to try to overcome that. Uh, and that's what makes me so excited about it.